What could concepts like civility, virtue, etiquette, discipline, what in the world could these have to do with the rise of secularism in Western society? Well, let's look at chapter two of Charles Taylor's book to see what he has to say about it. Welcome to Books and Big Ideas, what I'm reading, what I'm thinking about with Joel Wentz. All right, on into a secular age. This is chapter two, The Rise of the Disciplinary Society. What I want to do in this video is do my best to summarize kind of the main idea of the chapter, and then I want to unpack just some of the sub, sub ideas, the ways that he buttresses his main idea, his main argument in the chapter called The Rise of the Disciplinary Society. I feel like a broken record, but I'm not going to be able to cover every piece of the argument. It's such a nuanced, kind of complicated uh, argument. Even each chapter contains a pretty complicated argument within it. But I'm going to do my best to provide a summary and to provide some terms and handles, especially for people who haven't read A Secular Age yet, so that it can hopefully help them kind of wade into what Taylor's trying to argue. Um, so, that being said, let's dive into it. Um, the rise of the disciplinary society, kind of the, the main idea, if I can put it this way, is I, I see it as a deeper dive into one aspect of chapter one. And so if you haven't watched my video in chapter one, it's probably going to be pretty important for you to do that to get this. But one pillar of chapter one is what he calls the spirit of reform with a capital R. And so um, you can watch that video to get at what that is about. But I think this chapter two, it's fair to say, is a deeper dive into that pillar specifically. And the reform that he's talking about is this spirit of remaking society in a kind of a disciplinary way. Um, and so to get at that, he, he, this is an important term and concept in this chapter specifically, is the term civility. And so he is trying to unpack the, um, the rise of civility in Western society. And specifically, he's also trying to point to, for those of us who grew up in Western society and take civility for granted, he's trying to make the historical argument that civility is something that was created. And actually, this expectation of civility, specifically the expectation that every individual person within society should be a civil person, uh, involving things like etiquette, involving things like discipline and behavior, kind of raising the bar for behavior, so to speak, public behavior for every individual person, every individual person, um, that is civility, that, that every person is kind of like summoned to this kind of uh, standard of behavior, of civil behavior, polite behavior, etiquette uh, in society. That He's trying to point those of us in the West who have been embedded in the West for our lives, who probably totally take that for granted, um, he's trying to point to the fact that that wasn't always the case, and that's actually a, sp a specific kind of positive construction in Western society. Um, and so he's trying to point to the rise of it and trying to argue kind of where it comes from philosophically, but also he's trying to make the point that this is an important plank in the project, so to speak, of remaking society that would eventually give birth to what he calls exclusive humanism and our secular age. So that's my attempt to wrangle the main idea of this chapter, the rise of a disciplinary society, but civility is an ex extraordinarily important concept for this chapter. And what I want to do now is I want to unpack... Um, a couple really important shifts that he uh, outlines in this chapter. I think I'm going to try to cover three three shifts. Um, last time I talked about the different bulwarks of belief. This time I want to talk about three three philosophical moves that started to happen. Um, and the first one is pretty short. I actually talked about it in chapter one a little bit. Um, but this, uh, and this is a little bit of a surprising, if you're reading this chapter, it kind of feels like it comes out of left field because it starts with this, uh, in some ways, with this topic. And that is repeating the idea of shifting from a, the concept of living in a cosmos to living in a universe. This is shift number one, living in a cosmos to living in a universe. And what that really means, as I said in the previous video, is this shift from understanding ourselves as being, finding ourselves within an ordered place uh, in which kind of our, our task then as reflective humans is to discover our place within that order, right? Uh, that there's a certain kind of meaning we can glean from the stars, from our place in the world, um, that's kind of there for the discovery of it. Um, and that is a cosmos mindset, that you're in a cosmos. So a universe mindset is that there is no kind of intrinsic meaning to what's outside of us, and that actually it's our um, object as thinking humans to put meaning into what is there, to use, I'll come back to this language in a minute, but to use our will, our willpower to kind of uh, make order or to find meaning or to place meaning onto a what's inherently kind of a, a 
inherently lacking meaning uh, in its in its in its being in its in its substance. That's a universe mindset. So cosmos has order outside of ourselves. Uh, universe has none, and we got to impose it. These are themes that Charles Taylor comes back to a lot. You probably, if you've watched my other videos, you probably recognize some of the um, the ways that these concepts are kind of um, rhyming, so to speak. They're kind of coming back. Um, mean things like inside of us, outside of us, where can meaning be located, and all of that. So the shift to cosmos to universe thinking is is a really really important piece of the argument in the rise of a disciplinary society in chapter two. So just kind of keep that keep that in the back of your mind. Um, I want to spend a little bit more time on this next shift because this is this is pretty important. Um, underneath that cosmos universe shift is this other shift from contemplative to instrumental, contemplative to instrumental. And what I mean by this is it starts to make sense if you reflect on it a bit. But if it's true, these kind of map onto the cosmos and universe concepts respectively too. If it's true that the cosmos is inherently meaningful and has meaning in it, then the task of the intellect of human reflection is to, like I said, discover that meaning. And that is a contemplative task. That is a learning task. It's to, to observe and to learn and discover what's there, to contemplate it for no other purpose than to discover the meaning that's contained within or the meaning that's displayed. To, to, to contemplate for no other purpose. That's a really important distinction. No other purpose than to simply learn it. That's a contemplative um, approach. It's very different from the instrumental approach. The instrumental approach is to uh, learn for the sake of applying that knowledge to accomplish something, for the sake of making a change in the world, for the sake of uh, improving it, actually. That's a big driver is that in, we instrumentalize our reason and our learning um, so as to make improvements in the world. And that is bundled up with this mindset that the world uh, needs improving, actually. The world not doesn't necessarily have order. The world might be more a place of chaos or neutral at best than a place of order. And so our task is to learn about it so that we can improve it, so that we can um, make it more ordered. That's instrumental. Contemplative is merely to learn to discover the reason or, or the order that's already there. That's, I, that's, that, that's kind of a nuanced take, but I hope that, that makes sense because that's extraordinarily important for the bigger argument in chapter two, which is which is how did we take that mindset and place it kind of on ourselves as humans and on ourselves as a society? Meaning, how do we instrumentalize and get to the point where we wanted to learn uh, about ourselves so that we can improve ourselves? That's a really, really, really important shift philosophically and historically, at least as Taylor is arguing it. And I want to make the point here too, on, underneath this shift from contemplative to instrumental, science and the scientific approach, scientific method, empiricism, all that stuff. Science is bundled up in all of this, and it's kind of an accelerant, as Taylor would say. It's kind of a driver. Um, it's not necessarily the sole cause. And some of our like science, faith, religion, polemics and debates, at least as they happen today, they get bogged down on this and they get they misplace the like the blame. At least I'm in agreement with Taylor on this. I think science is bundled up in all of this change, but it's not the single silver bullet as to why we went from contemplative reason to instrumental reason. It's part of it, and the scientific method and all that stuff is absolutely part of it, but it's much more complicated than just being the sole cause. So I wanted to note that. Um, but um, what I want to say now before I get to kind of the, the last shift, uh, which has to do more with like human psychology and kind of our view of ourselves as humanity, is that this whole change, cosmos to universe, um, contemplative and instrumental reason, it birthed a new confidence. It birthed a new confidence in us. And it was this, if we can bring order and change to nature and to the world, then who's to say we can't bring order and change to ourselves. And this is a really, really important shift historically and societally and culturally and philosophically and all of those things. Um, and so now I want to take it before I get to the third, the third shift, I want to take a little bit of a detour. Um, and I want to talk a bit about this really, I think that he outlined it extremely well in this chapter. And he talks about the place of hierarchy in society and meaning the place of things like nobility and agriculture and servants and slaves and, um, he talks about the function of hierarchy in a way that I found very compelling and persuasive, at least persuasive as to how the ancient people thought. Um, and that is that um, 
the ancients viewed themselves, this, 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 this is why these things all hang together. It's why this book is at once so brilliant, but also can be hard to penetrate because everything is entangled and, and depends on each other. And you got to kind of grasp the whole picture at once. That's why I'm doing these videos. Um, so the hierarchical concept of one's place within society is bundled up with the concept of cosmos and order, right? And so the hierarchical concept was essentially that hierarchy is a given. Uh, and that there's nobility, there's kings, there's royalty, there's wealthy and there's poor. Um, there's people who work the land, there's people who pray, who are the religious side of all that. Um, and there's people who are secular, so to speak, in the earlier sense of the word, in that they just do more, quote unquote, profane work. They work the land, they work, they're farmers, they're blacksmiths, they're uh, artisans, whatever. Um, these things are neatly uh, kind of separated in the concept, um, and there is a hierarchy to them. There is indeed, like, nobility at the top, aristocracy at the top. Um, however, this is where he does a really good job at capturing. He captures this idea that that was accepted in a sense. It was accepted as a given because it's bundled up with the order of the universe. And that order is reflected in the humanity's place in, in a stratified society. Um, and it was accepted as something that wasn't necessarily changeable. Now, this is a lot of nuance here. He's not saying that it was an just full stop a good thing. And he's not even saying that everyone who was on the lower order of the hierarchy thought it was a, their place was good. So it, was, it wasn't accepted in that sense as, as though it was positively accepted or valorized, but it was merely accepted as intransigent. It wasn't something you could change. That's just how it was. Um, and so this hierarchical exception, like the, the, the acceptability at least of hierarchy in society um, is something that existed for centuries and for a long, long, long time in, well, in how humans organized themselves or saw themselves as, as organized rather. And so this is a, I found this to be extremely important as a piece of the overall argument because um, what I found really helpful about it is re wrestling with and grasping the difference for how we view ourselves in a well, liberal democracy, liberal meaning liberated from that hierarchy and liberated from that order, we don't accept the idea of stratification and hierarchy and order. That's, that's very far from our mindset. That is not a given for us. So how is that bundled up with this whole idea of the rise of the disciplinary society? Well, the spirit of reform uh, looked to reform that hierarchical stratified mindset, stopped accepting that mindset. Specifically, as it relates to the religious piece of the argument and the secular piece of the argument, um, the idea was to reform and remake this split between secular and sacred in that hierarchy. So, no longer were the monks and the nuns the only religious folks who prayed on behalf of the rest of society. No longer were people in profane, uh, secular, non-religious lines of work. But that, that distinction was to be leveled and um, everyone was, go, was to be... Um, now thought of as doing their vocations and their work and their and their livelihoods in a religious way, right? And so that requires a really, really intentional reform attitude to make that shift. And so, so what I want to now get to is um, my, my, my final shift that I'm identifying in his argument, which is um, harmony moving to domination, from harmony to domination. So what do I mean by this? This is where it starts to get into human psychology. Um, and so with all of this taken in mind, cosmos to universe, you know, uh, contemplative to instrumental reason, and then applying that to ourselves, there's a really profound shift in our understanding of what it meant to live a virtuous, peaceful life. And he has a whole section on stoicism as maybe being bundled up in all this too. Um, I'm not gonna take a huge tangent in that, but I do wanna name that stoicism is in this chapter. So if you're interested in stoicism, stoicism is a good discussion of it. But what I mean by harmony versus domination, is bundled up with all this other stuff. Um, so pre these shifts, the kind of uh, the idea of living a virtuous life was to live a life, uh, a harmonious acceptance of one's place in the order of things. A harm like that's how one achieved harmony and peace, inner peace even, even though they wouldn't have phrased it that way, because um, that's more of a modern framework on our kind of our inner life. But the idea was that harmony could be achieved by kind of a peaceful acceptance of one's place in in the order of things, as it's revealed by both the cosmos and human society and how human society is kind of organized to map onto the cosmos, right? And so pre all these shifts, one's harmony was dependent on one's ability to accept that. And you can kind of see, if you know anything about Stoicism, you can kind of see how the Stoics would kind of wrestle with this stuff. The shift, however, given this movement into instrumentalizing things over cont contemplative approach, so on and so forth, imposing order on the universe, is to kind of 
uh, is the move towards domination. And this, I alluded to this earlier when I used the language of will and willpower and how we can like will our order onto our surroundings and into our place in the world. Um, it's not merely about finding it or discovering it given to us. It's more about imposing it or putting it out there. That requires a significant will from within oneself, uh, from, from human psychology. And so the, the, the dominative approach became not just merely a harmonious acceptance, but actually a domination of things that we don't want to accept. So reason starts to become a really important piece of this. So the ascendancy of reason starts to cohere with domination and no longer harmonious acceptance of the passions, for example, and one's place in the world, but actually a, a domination of reason and the mind to subordinate things like the passions or to subordinate what one thinks is one's given place in the world and to put reason in its place. And those who lived a virtuous life were ones who could put uh, reason at the top of the hierarchy in human psychology. So it's hard not to think about people like Descartes. I think, therefore I am. Like the ascendancy of reason and human knowledge and human psychology and the human virtuous life uh, is all is all in a really, really important part of this. And so what I want to say now, connect this all back to the rise of the disciplinary society, these different shifts. Um, the ascendancy of reason is built on a really, really important shift in even our approach towards humanity, which is built on an important shift in our approach towards the world. And that shift is this, and this is Taylor's very uh, provocative on this point in this chapter. There's a shift in the mindset um, towards which we, we started to believe that humans and human society could be remade. That in itself is a major change. That's a major shift. Pre all these shifts, the idea of remaking society or reforming or making these like dominative changes wasn't even in the cards, so to speak. Wasn't on the radar <laughs> to use different metaphors. Um, but with all these shifts starting to take place, suddenly the mindset changed as to, as to say, actually humans can be remade. And if humans can be remade, human society can be remade. And that is where the spirit of reform starts to take root. And it's especially clear in places like Calvin's Geneva, which is really a kind of a theocratic city state, um, which had a really top down approach to, uh, um, well, discipline, to etiquette, to civility. And that's to loop this all back full circle. That's where the rise of civility comes from, is that um, if we're gonna remake human society and we're gonna apply dominative, instrumentalized reason because we're now in a universe, not so much of a cosmos, um, we're gonna apply all these things, then that means that human behavior needs to be kind of raised up, leveled out and raised up, right? And so things like the change in etiquette, and he has a really funny chapter or section in the chapter on the changes in etiquette. Things like not blowing your nose on the tablecloth when you're in public. Also not, um, and this is documented stuff. There's actually like documented um, written books on the changes in etiquette. Uh, it wasn't, you know, there's there's books written about that that talk about how it's not, uh, civil to defecate in public, and it's not civil to, if you see human feces on, on the sidewalk, to not pick it up and wave it around. Like, the fact that these rules existed, it meant that that was more commonplace at one point. And so we're so far away from that in terms of our etiquette, uh, it's hard to imagine, but Taylor's making the case that these shifts are all bundled up with all of these different philosophical concepts on what it even is. What is a human person? What is human society? What is our place? Um, and then what's the, the human capacity for change and reform? Uh, the shift towards saying we can actually remake all of society and make, make society a disciplined, civil, etic like place of uh, a certain threshold of etiquette on behalf of every single person, that's a major change from this acceptance of a hierarchical, stratified social order. Major, major change. And the last thing I want to say about this chapter is that all of these shifts, this is really, really important, all of these shifts take place for Taylor within religion, actually. So all of these shifts are happening under particularly Protestant Reformation kind of kind of shifts and cultural changes, um, but it's all religious like Calvin's Geneva. It was all conducted, this, this disciplinary society, top-down kind of coercion of etiquette and civility is 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 inherently religious and christian and it's cloaked in uh christian and religious ideals um but this is really crucial uh though it was religious taylor's argument is that it would have extremely unintended non-religious consequences and the way he puts it is that the shifts though they were religious in intent would set the stage and he uses the language they would kind of create the conditions culturally 
uh, for the emergence of exclusive humanism, which would create the conditions for the emergence of a truly secular age. And that's where he's going to go as the argument gains in force and complexity. Um, so there you go. There's my attempt to summarize uh, and paint a little bit of a picture of chapter two of a secular age. If you're reading along, if you pick up on different nuances, different things you would highlight or different questions you would have about this material, I would love to hear what those are. Um, if you're reading along for the first time, I'd also love to just hear what you think of this material. I think it's fascinating. I think it's extremely important, um, extremely powerful stuff. Um, so as always, I hope that you found something thought provoking or interesting here. And I really appreciate you taking the time to watch.